Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unuser Education. Um, I would like to start um, a new section of this course, <clears throat> the section which is called Double Integrals. Um, well, I, I think this would be my last section in this advanced course of mathematics for uh, teenagers. Uh, usually, um, the concept of double integrals is not covered in, in schools, but I think it's a relatively simple concept. It's just one step further from um, uh, regular uh, definite integrals. So, I decided that it probably makes sense, and it would be kind of a logical conclusion of this whole integral and calculus in general uh, theme for, for the high school students. All right, so, um, if you remember, when we were talking about definite integrals, we basically introduced the concept of area under the curve. So, if our function is defined on uh, a segment AB, um, then this area under the curve is basically an integral uh, from A to B. Now, the way how I define this is basically as a sum of rectangles built uh, under the function, uh, under the function's graph. And the sum of these uh, rectangles, sum of the areas of these rectangles, actually approximates the area under the curve. Now, obviously, we um, should have proven a theorem that regardless of how we divide our segment AB into smaller pieces, smaller and smaller, in the limit when the biggest of these pieces is um, uh, uh, shrinking down to zero, then the sum will have a one concrete uh, limit, which is called an integral. So, integral is basically a limit of um, so-called integral sums. Now, I would like to expand this picture to three-dimensional case. Now, this is in a two-dimensional case. We have function of one argument and area under its graph. Now, in three-dimensional case, we have function of two arguments, function of x, x and y, and um, it's defined for x between a and b and for y between c and d, so within this rectangle. And this is basically the graph of my function, uh, obviously not very artistically um, pleasant, but anyway, I'm sure you understand. So, this is the function, and I would like to know the volume in this case. We are talking about three-dimensional case, right? So, we are talking about the volume under this surface. Now, not the curve, now we are talking about surface in three dimension, right? So, on the top, it's uh, limited by this surface, which represents the three-dimensional graph of my function, f of f x, y. Now, on the bottom, it's x, y, plane and on the left and the right we have planes again um, um, bounding our area this is plane x is equal to a this is plane x is equal to b this is plane equal to c and 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 d so that's how my um, uh, sp space is actually defined and i would like to know the volume of this figure now, obviously, in the future, it might be expanded to not a rectangular area where it's defined, but some other more complex thing. But let's just talk about this right now. That's the simplest case. And that's how I'm going to introduce the double integral. All right, so I will do exactly the same as I did for a two-dimensional case and the function of one argument. I will def uh, d divide my rectangle where my function of two arguments x and y is defined uh, into smaller rectangles like this and on the top of each 
small rectangle as a base, I will build a um, rectangular parallelepiped, which means it's a flat on the top. It's flat on the bottom and it's flat on the top, but it touches the surface. So it grows as much as to touch the surface. So what will I get? Well, obviously, the volume of each, each particular uh, parallelepiped I, I know. I mean, that's the multiplication of three dimensions. And then I will add them up together. And then there are obviously the same kind of a theorem, um, similar to the two-dimensional case, that whenever I'm um, uh, shrinking the size of the uh, of these small rectangles, so the biggest of them goes down to zero. Um, I will have certain limit, and that limit would be the volume of um, this particular figure, object, whatever. So now let's just try to do this. So we will divide and uh, doesn't really work well. Let's try this one. So we will divide the segment from A to B into n different um, intervals. Let me use the capital N, rather M. And from C to Yn would be my division of um, along the y coordinates. So these are x's and these are y's. And on their crossing I will have this uh, subdivision of my area where uh, the function is defined into small rectangles. So let's talk about one particular rectangle. Um, now I will use double indices so rectangle, I don't know how to call it, R, I, Y, I, J. Now this rectangle is, um, on the X side, it would be from X, I, minus 1 to X, I. And for, on the white side, on the white, it would be from Y, uh, J minus 1 to Y, J. So this is a rectangle. It's somewhere here where its right uh, boundary is x uh, i and bottom boundary is y j. All right? So the area of this rectangle obviously is equal to um, x i minus x i minus 1 times i j minus uh, y j minus 1. So that's the that's the area of this um, rectangular parallelepiped which I'm going to build. Now what is its height? Well I was saying that I will grow this up until the, mo uh, the point where it touches the uh, the surface. I think it would be a little bit better and it would be exactly the same result if I will just take one of the corners of this small rectangles, the one which has uh, the coordinates x, i, and y, j, and whatever the value of the function is in this particular corner, I will set as the height of this rectangle. So my volume, i, j, would be equal to function of x i y j times x i minus x i minus один minus one y j minus y j minus one. So that's my volume of one particular uh, 
uh, uh, rectangular parallelepiped. Now, what do I have to do to uh, approximate the whole volume? Well, I have to summarize this by i and by j. So i is changing from 1 to m and j is changing from 1 to n. Now, let me just write it slightly differently. So this is my volume. I will call it mn. So it's not the real volume, it's a volume based on approximation of division by m on the x and by n um, along the y-axis, all right? Now, then, if I will increase the m and n to infinity and simultaneously make these smaller and smaller, the theorem is, which I'm not going to prove, but again, that's I, I spent a lot of time in a two-dimensional case. It's basically going along along the same along the same line. So, the theorem is that no matter how you divide your rectangle into smaller rectangles by these um, points of division, as long as the maximum among x i minus x minus i one goes to zero and the maximum among these goes to zero which incidentally means that m and n both should go to infinity so as long as this is done under certain assumption about the function f it should be smooth in some way so continual differentiable etc i mean there are certain functions which are only considered for these particular purposes and um, in, in theory, for instance, the, um, the continuity is sufficient. But uh, there are some weaker actual requirements, but we are not talking about this. Most of the functions you will be dealing with are relatively smooth. So for all these smooth functions, the limit of that thing, as this goes to zero and this goes to zero, uh, and, and m and n goes to infinity, exists. And this limit will be the volume uh, of this particular figure we are talking about. Now, let me just um, change slightly the notation here. Um, I will use the following. It's uh, sigma, sigma. Let's say first we sum by i, and then we sum by j. Now f of x i y j and I will put here delta x i and this is delta y j I will use this notation why because it's a little bit more familiar because if you will consider y j as a constant which is not really changing yet and just consider this piece what does it remind you? As delta xi goes to zero and m goes to infinity, this part must have the limit. Now, what is this limit? Let's just think about it. This limit is the following. So you fixed yj, which is somewhere here, which means there is a yj and yj minus one. So you fix this particular slice, if you wish, of this figure. And then you are making these x smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? So that's what it actually means. So eventually you will get the volume of this slice only. Right? If i j and i y uh, i, I, I j and i j minus 1 are, are fixed, then you have a slice of this figure and to basically make a volume of this slice, you basically do whatever I just said, right? Now, from regular integrals, from definite integrals, you remember that this thing, when m goes to infinity and all delta x's uh, are, are going to zero, that's the definition of the integral. From the beginning, which is a to the end, of function f of x comma y j, 
dx. That's what it is, right? So if I will replace this with this, it will be a function of uh, yj, right? So I have now function uh, sigma from j1 to n dy, uh, well, delta, first delta. Now, if this is considered to be a function of yj, so what is this? as n goes to infinity and delta y goes to um, uh, to zero, that is basically, again, an integral. In this case, it's by y, from c to d, g of y, dy. Or, in our expanded notation, it would be integral from c to g is external integral, from a to b is internal, f of x, y, dx, dy. And that's the definition of the integral, of double integral in this case. All right? So I didn't really do much above and beyond from the understanding standpoint to whatever we were talking about when we introduced the um, definite integral uh, for the function of one variable. So this is a kind of an equivalent for the function of two um, arguments, f and x, y. Now, here is a very interesting consideration. What I am saying is I really don't want to have these brackets. And here is why. Think about the logic how I came up with this one. I had a double sum when first I fixed my y coordinate and then I sum by x. At the same time, I could come up with the same volume by fixing x coordinates from here to here, from x i minus 1 to x i, and make a slice of this figure and calculate the volume of this side, uh, of this slice. And then as um, by, by actually making y smaller and smaller and smaller, all right? And um, that actually means that I have reversed the summation. The summation in this case would be from, um, from i from 1 to m, then for j from 1 to n, f of x i j delta y j delta x i. So I just change these two uh, deltas, which doesn't really change anything at all. It's still double sum. Double sum can be calculated like, uh, I know, columns and then um, rows, or rows and then columns. It's still the same sum of all the elements in this whole table, two-dimensional table uh, of x's and y's. And now this looks like sigma from 1 to m integral f of x i comma y that's y g, right? Uh, dy That's delta. And now, again, this is some kind of a function of xi. And the whole thing, actually, uh, as a limit, when delta xi goes to infinity, it goes to dx and integral from a to b. 
by the way, this integral from C to G by 1, which is exactly the same. So that's why I can really get rid of these, because they are exactly the same. I change the order of integration. I don't need I anymore. I change the order of integration, and I've got exactly the same result, which is the volume under this particular surface. So, my point right now is that I have introduced a new concept, which is called double integral. It's really analogous to uh, integral to definite, definite integral uh, for functions of one uh, argument, um, but in this case, that's the uh, function of two element, uh, two uh, arguments, and uh, obviously, the graph of this function is surface now. Um, there is one complication if you will compare it with a one-dimensional uh, case with a function of one argument. You see, function of one argument. function of one argument can be defined only on a simple segment from A to B. Function of two arguments obviously can be defined on a rectangular uh, domain, x from A to B and y from C to G. However, you can actually consider some other function which is defined on a much more complex area here which is not really, may maybe it's a circle function is defined on a circle is it possible? well, yes consider a sphere for instance a sphere which, which has a center at the origin of coordinate is actually defined on all those x and x's and y's which are within circle, right? Because that's, that's how sphere actually is defined. Outside of the circle there are no values of my function. Well, let's talk about half a sphere, right? Because the whole sphere has top and bottom, but half a sphere is really some kind of a surface which, rep which, which can be represented as a formula. So, that would be a complication which I will address uh, in the next lecture. But it might be really a, a slight complication. However, in case of rectangular area, uh, of where, where, which is actually a domain of our function f of x, uh, f of x, y, um, situation is really like this one, which means you can really exchange, uh, because these are constant from a to b and from c to g. They define this rectangle where it's defined, where the function is defined. So, uh, in this case, it's really kind of symmetrical. You can change the order of integration. Um, in case of, you know, more complicated domain, you cannot. But we will talk about this separately. Okay, so, so far this is basically the introduction, this is the overview of what is a double integral in the simplest case when domain is represented by a rectangle from a, B on X and from C, D, C to D on, on Y. That, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.